Gomez. Can I please, please, sir. Can I request Mr. Aiken to please uh, give him a shawl? Welcome him with a shawl. Show some love by clapping, please, all of us. Over to you, Mr. Suresh, sir. Thank you. Hopefully, there are more people now inside than outside. Very good afternoon, friends, and uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity to be with you. I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, very well organized and one of the most talked about conference uh, right here. So absolutely, I think, uh, fantastic arrangement and looking at you people having turned up in so much numbers seriously encourages us, encourages us about the industry that we are in and the future of the industry as well. I just thought maybe I'll start off, uh, I'll come to my topic, but since I'm here for the first time, allow me a couple of minutes to introduce our company, because some of you have worked with us, and maybe for a few of you, it may be a relatively new name. So maybe I'll just spend a couple of minutes on introducing what this company is all about, the company that I represent, DHF Primerica Asset Managers. Uh, essentially, we are a 50-50 joint venture between Prudential of USA and DHFL group here in India. Headquartered in Mumbai, 24 cities. Uh, last year, we did a couple of things. You know, as a company, we existed as Primerica standalone since 2010, and we were a relatively small player until about uh, early last year. We used to manage assets of around 2,000 crores or thereabout. Last year in March, we did the largest acquisition ever in India of an asset management company. That was Deutsche Asset Management Company's acquisition. We, with that acquisition, our assets from 2,000 crores went up to 18,000 crores in the month of March. Now, with your support, uh, with uh, all of you helping us through over the period of time to me and my team, now we manage assets of 29,000 crores. So over the last nine months, we have grown more than 50% in assets under management. And of course, we have a range of products, both equity, fixed income, and PMS products. Maybe I'll spend just a couple of minutes on uh, each of the promoters, and then I'll come straight to the topic. Uh, Primerica name in my uh, brand name, DHFL, stands for Prudential of America. Uh, so most of you would be familiar with Prudential of UK, which is a partner with ICACI. In fact, there happens to be another company by name Prudential, which is there in USA, and it's a 140-year-old insurance and asset management giant. We are a part of that company. Uh, it is just that uh, Prudential brand name, we use it in Americas, we use it in a few other countries, and in, in, in India, since there's already another company by name Prudential, we use the brand name Primerica. In terms of the size, we would be similar to Prudential of UK, overall by, as a life insurance company in asset management. Um, as an asset management company or the mutual fund business, we would probably be globally um, twice as large as Prudential of UK. But of course, in India, we need to grow further with your support, and we need to build much stronger connect with you. So overall, it's a very large, established, 150-year-old company with great deep-rooted uh, presence across all financial markets, a very large giant by itself. And DHFL, which is a relatively local name, most of you would have uh, heard about it. It's a triple rated housing finance company, has a portfolio of about 75,000 crores, and is the second largest private sector housing finance company in India. So I just thought I'll give you a bit of a background about the company that I represent and the two promoters. But more importantly, I want to move to the topic of the day, which is value or volume. What is that we should be going after? Uh, since all of you have come from lunch, may I ask you, what did you consume? Was it value or volume? <laughs> See, the fact is, you can do. So there was somebody who said both. In fact, which probably is the right answer, you can vol consume volume if you see value. So you can't have the food in volume unless the chef has made it to your taste, 
He served you in a convenient manner and the food appearance is appealing and it is customized to the audience that it is being served to. So if we are sitting here in Chennai, then we would want a bagla bhat or a lot of uh, or sambar. And if you are sitting in Calcutta, we will probably expect a fish curry. So customization is a very essential part. The food has to be appealing. It has to be tasty. Otherwise, forget about the volume. You won't even want to touch it. So the reality is there can be no volume without value. The starting point is essentially having a value proposition before you can hope to build volume. Holds true for uh, this restaurant there where we just ate and holds true for our business as well. What is the value proposition that we bring to the client so that he does volume with us? Volume is actually an outcome, but what goes inside is our value proposition. And our value proposition essentially comes from multiple factors. Some of them I have listed here. But I just wanted to, at this point of time, uh, narrate to you a simple story about my interaction with uh, my headquarters at Prudential in USA. And what did I learn from there? I visited Prudential's headquarters first time after the merger sometime in June last year. And essentially, I wanted to understand the trends in US market on the financial advisory business. I went there and I asked my colleagues there as to what is happening in the financial advisory business. Are the clients moving direct? Are they going to robo-advisory? Are they using a financial advisor? I got a very straight answer. And that straight answer was that irrespective of the industry that you talk about, there is a certain segment of the market which wants to do it themselves, DIY do it yourself. That segment is about 25% of the market. So these are the people who go to an IKEA store, which is a furniture store in USA, buy a knockdown double bed, sit at home, put the nut bolts, tighten it, and then they feel happy about it that I've created a furniture by myself. But that's about 25% of the industry. 75% people will actually pick up the stuff and ask IKEA, please send your carpenter to assemble it for me so that it doesn't creak, there are no scratches, and there are, uh, it remains in a good shape. Interestingly, in USA, the same holds true for financial advisory, advisory business as well. It's the same proportion, 25% people who choose to go direct, and 75% people who essentially use a financial advisor. My question then to them was, why do people use a financial advisor? What is it that the person brings to the table? And we have done extensive study there, and this model of advisory versus distributor has remained there for many years. The finding of the industry was, uh, finding of the study was, the advisors are important essentially for three reasons. The reason number one, the very act of investment entails a delayed gratification. The very act of investment means you are delaying your current consumption and you're putting aside money for a future value. Now, as an individual, today you have money, you can blow it in a party, you can buy the best car that your uh, car of your dreams, but you choose not to do that, but set aside the money for a future goal. That, mo that goal requires a motivation, and it has been found there by studies that more often than not, people by themselves can't come up to setting aside the money for long term, they need a motivation. And at that point of time, people like you come in and they add value. The second value proposition essentially was that there are a lot of people who start direct. Now what happens is, oftentimes you start direct, market goes fine, you are, you are having a smooth journey. But when the volatility comes and hits you for the first time, when you see the market crashing by 20%, you don't know what to do. As a direct customer, you don't know whom to go to. The machine does not tell you, at least with conviction, that this will come back. And then people choose to exit. And that's where the value proposition comes in from IFA, where the person says, this is not the first time, this is probably the, not the last time the market will fall, but stay on course. I know it, I have seen it, and 
you know what the right course of action for you to do it is as follows so the value proposition there is to keep people on track and deliver them confidence uh, empathy and hold them through this emotion let people not become their own worst enemy the emotions are your worst enemy sometimes and the third value proposition which uh, they indicated was that once people reach a certain threshold of investment let's say a $30,000 or $40,000 in USA they want a customized solution they essentially basically want to sit across with an advisor and say this is my situation I have to send my son to college in four years time I have to buy this property for which I need this money and by the way I'm running this loan so I need somebody to help me so customized solution is another value so these three are essentially the point why people choose a financial advisor in that market now when you're looking at yourself think about what is the value proposition that you are bringing to the table and without that volumes are just not going to happen so for example uh, how are you supporting the client when one the very basic level is convenience the second level of course is knowledge and the third level is sitting across with client and doing a customized solution and knowledge does not necessarily mean only learning about the let's say budget reaction or for that matter hearing about somebody's commentary on what has happened to RBI action and stuff like that it's not only the current report but it's also reading books and forming a lot more evolved view about how to navigate through markets which are inherently volatile and then holding people through that so that conviction comes in once you have read about it once you've seen it once you have interacted with people so our essential value proposition requires that as well and the, the other one is of course being customer centricity trying to understand what is the right product for the client and then setting it around so overall I think the idea here starts with knowing your customer analyzing him what you want what what his needs are what is that he's looking for then of course knowing what your product or service that you have that can fulfill his needs and then of course all of us stay in a competitive world knowing what your competitors are offering and what is your value edge over that and then come up with a proposition that you can offer putting it all together and then creating a review mechanism so that you're able to conduct it over a period of time now this model of course can work for high value clients when you're trying to reach mass market then of course there can be a variation of the model but the essential point is to be able to identify what are the tools that we require for adding value to the client and then volumes are essentially a end result that will flow it's not the starting point I just wanted to spend a few minutes with you on discussing a few ideas and uh, maybe after that we'll probably uh, spend a little more time on this maybe a Q&A with you now at this point of time we are sitting around in a post demonetization world where a lot of money is sitting in the banks there's surplus liquidity everywhere and the bank deposit rates have fallen to as low as six and a half to seven percent which means the post tax returns are about four to four and a half percent for the client at the same time the tax-free bonds which used to yield about eight percent or there about a couple of years back are no longer in issues and the old one are trading at six percent yield or even lower so indeed the clients do not have many many options to choose from for example when it comes to a large pool of money which is sitting in fixed income and interestingly you have enough number of options which are available on the mutual fund side which can fulfill that gap so while equity mutual fund is something that we advocate all the time and that is indeed something which will work for a lot of clients but we also have to understand where is the what is the mindset that the client is coming from if he's a fixed depositor then bulk of his money would still probably look for fixed income options and there you have a very simple proposition where the bank deposits are giving you four four and a half percent tax free whereas mutual funds with a long-term capital gain benefit have traditionally performed easily 8% plus tax free in past and with the rates declining a little bit they can still perform 
at least 300, 250 to 300 basis point over the bank deposit. Value proposition is very simple. If you try to get that guy directly to equity products, some of them may not necessarily be amenable to the entire pool of money. So there is probably something that can come in between. And this pool of money is very large. Irrespective of the market cycles, in India, in mutual fund industry, we have seen that about 65 to 70 percent of the money at all time remains in fixed income of the entire industry assets. And the bank deposits continue to grow year after year. So that is a market which is very large. We don't talk about it as much because the focus always tends to be on equity. But this is an equally large opportunity that you should look at. Uh, then you can look at, you can study and there are interesting variations which come around on the product and some of the asset managers uh, including uh, us have put together some very interesting small facilities and this indeed is one facility that we have created in our product called long term withdrawal facility. And this is based on an idea which actually came from IFA community about a year back. So when I was interacting with IFAs in Calcutta. A group of IFAs came to us and they actually suggested that if you create a product like this, this can be very tax efficient. And uh, we indeed went back and created that facility because it appealed to us as well. And then we have seen uh, good interest in it and then there are a couple of other asset managers who offer this as well. Essentially what we do here is we try to create, you know, if you take your uh, fixed income investments by way of dividend there is a TDS of around 28%. But instead of that, if you can create a long-term withdrawal facility where you can say, I want to withdraw half a percent or 2.75% per month, it becomes very tax efficient because that many number of units are being redeemed every month and you have a long-term capital gain on a very, or you have a capital gain on a very small portion of earning. The effective tax rate in this facility comes down to about 8 to 9 percent tax rate compared to 29 percent tax rate that you pay in case of a dividend plan in a debt fund. A very simple option available to you in general not only from our fund house but a few more fund houses and yet I find that this facility has not been picked up as much as the concept is powerful. I think there's, there's a lot more that can be done. So here what happens is you can determine what is the regular flow of cash that the client will get every month. And a lot of clients have this monthly income requirement. So you can put that money into the fund. Let's say you want to put uh, 1 lakh rupees in the fund, you can get something like about 750 rupees every month by way of withdrawal. And broadly, with some small variation here and there, your principal can remain broadly intact. And yet the withdrawal that you make is subjected to much lower taxation by way of capital gain, which is about 8 to 9 percent. So this could be one way in which you can uh, explore uh, giving a solution to some client who are looking at monthly income in a much more tax efficient manner compared to what they are getting. The other, of course, is that we keep talking about uh, equity market, but at the same time there are different valuation levels and as an advisor we are supposed to asset allocate it from fixed income to equity and there are, there are various models which are available in the market which are some of them are PE ratio. We have a model called power goals. It's done extremely well over the last five years and essentially the model shifts money from equity to fixed income when the market seem overheated. And uh, this can be applied both in way of both by way of SIP as well as uh, on a lump sum basis. Similarly, there are other models which are available in the market, and I'm sure you can study some of them and take your own call. Um, I think the pool of opportunity is big. There are many more ideas which are uh, essentially there in the market which are uh, available. Keep yourself updated with them. Be open to some of these uh, new concepts which will come out in the market and then take your own calculated call. Your value addition is what is going to drive the business growth over a medium to long term. And it's not necessarily just, uh, let's say, doing a product pushing. Uh, as an AMC, we realize that even we need to add value to the distribution community that is working and helping us build our business. 
essentially what we have tried to do as an asset management company and we hope to do with more of you over a period of time is probably some of these initiatives that we have launched. One of the things that we are trying to do is uh, we have organized a program called Visit to Kitchen where we invite uh, some of our IFA partners to visit us and spend a day in our office with our investment team uh, and understand the investment process, understand our thoughts and give us questions, come up with questions, give us suggestions on what we can do to improve the service quality to them. I hope to be able to do with more of you. I can see some people in the audience who have attended these sessions and would look to do more with more of you. The other is while mutual fund is our business, as an advisor, oftentimes you are faced with a situation where the clients need more than just investment advice. They probably can uh, need help in terms of doing the transition to the next generation. So we have launched a program for estate planning where we, have, uh, we are engaging with the IFAs and we are trying to conduct training sessions on that. And then there are uh, training programs that we have launched on both uh, selling as well as in terms of improving your soft skills. And then of course there are regular contests that we keep doing. So the, in a nutshell, uh, volume is something that all of us are after and uh, would want to grow over a period of time. But uh, what it requires is that the journey starts with value. The journey really starts with putting a proposition on table which creates value for the client. And then volumes are an outcome. So maybe I'll pause here and uh, we'll throw the floor open for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Sadly, the stark reality is that AMC identify us only when we give volume. Then no, no, don't look at us with value, what we are giving. That's right, right? Am I right? AMC is engaged with, based on your current volume as well as future volume. And in the end, all of us do business, but at the same time, volume is an outcome. But the process of engagement is more about creating value for you. Yeah. Right. Uh, one advice which I, I, I don't know about that uh, visit to the kitchen, but the initial thoughts which, I came, which came to me was maybe you wanted to involve the family member, the spouse to go, come to your office, maybe that's what hit that's what me. Maybe you can think on those lines and bring them and show them what your husband is really doing, how much he is working. So they think, they are machine, they will take something so maybe you can think on those lines and get us, help us interact more and uh, ensure that our spouse are contributing to our, maybe you can look at it, but the, because the name suggested that one. Fair enough. Yeah, thank you. No, the, the reason why we had the word kitchen is because that's where our, we are cooking the products. That's why it. the I name came it. in. I but uh, I take your suggestion, I think uh, the family has to be as much a part of it. All of you are entrepreneurs and indeed, the family needs to feel that what you are doing is extremely valuable, which is what it is. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, Suri from Hyderabad. Yeah. Incidentally, I am one who has visited your kitchen. All right, sir. So, I was going through your DHFL Pramerica long-term withdrawal facility. I have a small doubt. During the withdrawal period, no doubt that DDT is not there, but the capital gains tax will certainly be there at least during the first three years. Right. Have you made any uh, comparison chart or any uh, visual on that? If it is there, kindly distribute. Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, indeed, there is a capital gain incident, but let me, I do not want to bore you with too many details, but let me explain the point. Let's say today you invested in the fund, the current NAV is 10 rupees. At the end of one year, the fund has grown by 10% to 11 rupees. Now at that point of time, if your 1 lakh rupees that you had invested, you want to withdraw 10,000 rupees from that, 
because that is the gain in the portfolio. If you took it as dividend, that 10,000 rupees would have been subjected to 28% distribution tax and you would have got 7,000 rupees, 7,200 in your hand. Now, if you redeemed units equivalent to 10,000 rupees, then about 1,000, let's say 900 units will be redeemed from you at 11 rupees, which will give you about 10,000 rupees. The gain that you will make on that is 1 rupee into 900 units. So 900 rupees is the gain that you have made. On that you will pay tax of about 30%, which will come to, let's say, 270 rupees on a withdrawal of 10,000 rupees, which is 2.7%. So compared to the tax that you would have paid on the entire dividend amount, here you are paying tax only on the gain amount of the withdrawal. So of the 11 rupees NAV at which the unit is redeemed, you are essentially paying tax on 1 rupee of the gain because 10 rupees is your principal coming back to you. It's more from a taxation perspective that it works where your effective tax liability comes down very sharply. And in order to make it feasible for you, what we have done is we have removed exit load to the extent of 10% withdrawal every year. So whatever withdrawal you are making, there will be no exit load also on that. Yeah. I don't know if I have been able to explain, but uh, is it clear to you? Welcome, yeah. sir. Actually, sure. you have a product where the market crash is going to be fixed deposit. Again, you have to buy a solution. If you buy and sell, you have to pay a cost waste. The fund Profit Badikada. Okay. Uh, I could not completely understand Tamil, though I have lived in Chennai for six years. I must say I'm a bad learner of language. But uh, what you're saying is if there is a redemption happening in the fund and it go, goes from equity to debt and comes back into equity, there's a transaction cost. Yeah? But at the same time, the transaction cost. Uh, compared to the transaction cost, the overall returns that you make is much higher, sir. And we have seen this model working for multiple years now. So question so, is which product? The which uh, this, product? Is, this is a power goal facility that we offer in all our equity funds. Where the money moves between equity fund Sorry. to our debt fund. Yeah.